Welcome, everyone. Um, as I said before, this is a webinar that I'm very excited about. It's going to change the game, I think, in terms of how we uh, translate geometry from Rhino to Revit and Revit back to Rhino. Uh, but before we get started, I'm just going to give you guys a quick little um, overview of what Microdesk does. Um, so we're um, an AECO technology consulting firm. We have multiple facets uh, in our company from software development to asset management to consultants that deal with all the different trades. Um, we've been around since 1994 and we're um, very well sort of dispersed with the geography of the United States, East Coast, West Coast time, Midwest. Um, we have another office in London and some satellite offices uh, around the world. Um, highly educated bunch of professionals that I love working with, um, lots of PhDs in there and uh, registered architects. Um, what is our mission? Uh, I think with, with the advent of where the world is going, uh, I am going to say that we really need to start focusing on globalization and urbanization. Um, in order for buildings to be sustainable, uh, we need to start thinking about how to make our cities healthy. So we offer services to firms in order to make you know, their efficiencies, the way we make buildings, the way we sort of treat the world better. Uh, what we do, um, we offer services in design, construction, and operations. Each one of these, we like to follow the sort of life cycle of the building process and see it through so we can jump in at any, any moment or see a building go from, you know, uh, schematic to actual operations to demolition again and back to operations. Uh, some of our services. Uh, these are some of our partners. We have a couple of new ones. Um, Life Smart, and we're building more and more. We're in front of this platinum partner. And this is me. Uh, I just want to give you guys a quick visual. Uh, just a little head over here. How's everyone doing today? Um, as I said, uh, my name is Chirji uh, Shurti. I'm a strategic implementation advisor here. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a little bit of background about me. Um, I've got about 10 years of experience. I am, and this is very important in relation to this webinar, I am software agnostic uh, in that I believe all the, the software we use should not be defined by um, a company. I think it should be defined by the goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, lately, I've been getting into data science and computational design. I am a certified AI business advisor, um, and I love cross-pollinating software workflows, which is what this webinar is going to be about. So let's get started. Um, and I'd like to add that uh, if you can leave your questions in the chat, towards the end of the presentation. I'm going to leave about 10 minutes. We might go a little bit over, uh, but I think that's still great uh, because there's a lot of information that I've condensed into this, uh, this webinar. Um, I definitely want to give a big shout out before I get started to the Co-Innovation Lab, uh, who's helped uh, me put this together. It's part of our R&D uh, department, and uh, I would call it the glue of tying in Autodesk and Rhino through this process. Um, it's been very fun working with those guys, and we've got a lot of cool webinars coming down the line. So today's agenda. Let's talk about what is Rhino inside. Uh, let's talk about a history of the pains of translating information from Rhino to Revit. Um, we will talk about the Rhino ribbon inside Revit and Grasshopper, and then we'll get into it. We'll, we'll really show how to translate a project, how to translate geometry, go back and forth, 
we're going to create a native family, and then we're going to end uh, the presentation with uh, adaptive components using some portion of paneling tools. Um, I really like this slide, and I'm going to give another big shout out to the McNeil team uh, because they really helped put together um, some scripts for me and have troubleshot all the all the bugs and glitches. And uh, we like to call um, I know inside of Pandora's box, and I've got two definitions sort of in these images here that um, it is a Pandora's box because you're opening up the Red API through um, through Grasshopper using Python, and um, you're releasing a lot of things and dirtying up, you know, the Revit uh, platform. However, I think uh, as in this image here, uh, what was left behind in Pandora's box was um, hope. So I have hope that you know eventually we'll get the kinks and bugs out and uh, we will be utilizing this on a daily for translation of geometry. On the other side here, we've got you know uh, the release of all the sciences, which uh, I'm using this as a metaphor here, but I do believe that um, opening up the NURBS modeler inside of BIM platform uh, will create some serious opportunities for how we think about geometry and it definitely will sort of upgrade the math that we're using and how we translate information. And we can all play nice now and be in, in the same sandbox a little bit. Um, so I didn't really explain what Rhino Inside is, but first I'm going to talk about what you need in order to have it operate on your uh, machine. So you will need a uh, a Rhino license, which will get you uh, Rhino WIT, which is Rhino Work in Progress. Uh, essentially, it's Rhino 7. And then you will need to install um, the Rhino inside for Windows beta. Um, so both of these two uh, you, should, you should look for. And, uh, you know, the WIT comes free if you have a Rhino license, and then the Rhino Inside is also free. It's still in beta. It's been around for a year. Um, I was sort of testing it when it was still bleeding edge. Uh, and now I've started to implement it into some offices. Uh, so let's talk a, a little bit about the history of translating geometry. Um, this used to be a pain when we wanted to go and build something that, you know, was somewhat unbuildable in Revit or the constraints, the time, what have you, was not allowing for it to be built inside of Revit. And this does happen, Revit has its constraints. Um, so what we would do is we would either export in one of these formats, and then we would go into Rhino and manipulate our platform or build it directly in Rhino and bring it back into, um, into the Revit platform, either as an SAT or as a DWG or any one of these that it was willing to accept. Uh, as the years passed on, there was some plugins. Rhinomo came in and was kind of saving the day for a while on the Dynamo ends. Uh, there was the translation of the geometry into, you know, Excel matrices that had to be reshuffled and then hopefully would come in through, uh, through Dynamo. And then there was a little company called Flux.io, which was very good at doing this. Uh, they went down last year, but I don't think the knowledge base was lost. Um, so that's what was happening uh, for a while. And now with the advent of Rhino Inside, we're going to talk about what's possible. Um, so this is Rhino Inside. Rhino Inside is a plugin, and what it does, it allows you to go back and forth between the Revit API to the Rhino um, modeling space. Uh, and it uses Grasshopper in order to do that. Uh, it can do it directly. There are new plugins. Um, I'm going to be talking mostly about Grasshopper today because I feel like it's, it's more optimized, it's advanced, it does what you need to get done. Um, but essentially, it allows you to go back and forth between the two platforms and create geometry. Uh, today's presentation, our software economy is going to be including, um, you know, the said Rhino Inside, Rhinoceros, Grasshopper, a little bit of paneling tools towards the end, 
and Autodesk Revit. I am super uh, excited about this. I believe that they only follow through um, to, I think, Revit 2017. I'm, I'm going to get corrected on this. Obviously, uh, hit up Scott Davidson and the McNeil team. They're very helpful when it comes to this. So let's talk about a little bit the ribbon, what it is, what it does, and how we use it. So what I'm doing here is I am opening up Rhino inside of the Revit environment. Uh, and here I've got a simple ribbon where I can talk about, you know, icon, I've got grasshopper, I've got a way to visualize my, my ghost in the shell when it comes to the grasshopper information translating through. I've got some solvers, and I've got ways to bake in this information. Um, so something to note here is that the way that we're doing this is we're literally translating, and by we, I mean uh, Rhino Inside, is translating the, the Revit API through Python back to Rhino, back to Revit, and this is how you're able to open up this, this plugin inside of um, inside of Revit. So what I've done here is I've just launched Rhinoceros, uh, which is in beta now. Um, and now I've launched Grasshopper inside of Rhino. And this Grasshopper is a visual scripting language. And what I'm looking at here are the custom Revit nodes that you will not be able to see in any other form of Grasshopper except for the one that you open up in Rhino inside. Uh, and this is slowly growing, and it's gotten bigger and bigger and more powerful. Um, UI is getting even better. I, uh, I'm, I'm excited about what's coming down the line. We've got subcategories, nested families that are literally being scripted. Um, another thing that I really want to note that's very important here is that it does expire Rhino Whip and Rhino Inside expires every 45 days, I believe. They might have changed it, but so keep that in mind. You want to be updating this, um, or when when the time comes, you want to kind of update it in advance. And when those updates happen, you are going to get a little bit of uh, rebuilding of some nodes because they're still working on this. So the first example that I want to talk about is how we can take just native Revit geometry um, that I built here as an example model and translate it into the Rhino environment. A uh, couple of things. One, why is this important? Well, let's say you have information that you need to build inside of here. So what I'm doing here is I'm opening up a script that I've written. Uh, I'm going to do a, a shameless plug here because uh, this is also something that the Co-Innovation Lab has been working on. Um, we've color-coded our Grasshopper library, and we're looking to roll that out sometime next year. But we've basically taken uh, the Dynamo standard, as you can see here, and applied it to, to Grasshopper. Uh, I think this is going to be really great for both visual scripting softwares to have some kind of standard that we follow. Um, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm essentially picking a category that I would like to bake into the Revit, uh, sorry, into the Rhino environment. Uh, and I'm using some Python nodes uh, to do it. Uh, and so this is one way to bake information. Uh, I'm changing this. Uh, and so actually that should say Rhino. It's funny, I didn't know why I changed that. Um, when I bake it in, as you can see, the, the ghost of the grasshopper uh, model is, is latent in the background inside of Revit. And now I've got it um, showing up inside of Rhino. There we go. Um, so what I'm doing here is I just baked in the roots. 
And as I was saying, why is this important? Well, many different reasons. Uh, let's say you've got an office that, you know, is highly adept at using uh, Rhino in the capacity to model faster, and they need to bring in some geometry that's sort of unfeasible to, to build in Revit at the time, maybe you're in like the massing stage or what have you. Uh, this would be a great use case for this. Uh, another reason is it maintains origins. So your origin points are the same. And so when you're translating the information back into Revit, uh, it's going to line up uh, with what you have here in Rhino. Uh, the other reason is, let's say you wanted to take this to a rendering engine, uh, let's say uh, Unity or Unreal, you could much easier manipulate it in here uh, and leave your BIM model um, to continue creating the documents that. So I've just baked in a couple of walls, I've baked in some doors, uh, and I'm going through and baking in uh, the rest of the information that's in my model. Uh, one thing to notice is that at the bottom, there's different ways that these scripts work. But essentially, it's pretty real time, depending on the, the complexity of the geometry. And another thing that I do love about this process is it does layer up your information based on categories. So Revit subcategories and categories are very important. Um, and see, at the bottom here, I have another script where I can filter through those categories and move the elements uh, over to Rhino. Now, sometimes these scripts have kinks, and I'm showing this for a reason. So as you can see, it is failing on me. Why it's failing, I think it's having a hard time with, and it's just a simple floor that I'm looking to, to pipe in there, which is why I, um, I have two different types of scripts to test out on this. As I said, there's still bugs in this, and they need to be worked out, but there's more than one way to write something into, um, into Rhino. So there we go. I brought in the whole building. Uh, floors, doors, walls, and roofs. Um, and the other thing that I do really love about this process is that, you know, they're beautiful surfaces. They're not meshes. And that's something to keep in mind. This was something that we've always had a problem with in the translation. Um, another thing, the reason why I picked the last one is that let's say that you did uh, translate geometry from Rhino back into Revit. When you want to pull that geometry out of Revit, it is a little bit more difficult to get it out. So everyone keep that in mind. This process really likes only the Revit categories that were natively made in Revit. Um, if you have piped in information from Rhino into Revit as generic or as like furniture families, you might have a harder time getting them out. As I said, this is still being developed, so let's look forward to next year and what the McNeil team can do. And also the Autodesk team, I love that they're all collaborating now. So for my next example, uh, I've got a script where I am going to be bringing in information from Rhino now using an origin point into Revit. And this becomes useful, as I said, when you have geometry that you just can't build, uh, and also that you might be able to build faster, or you know, knowledge base of the team uh, differs, what have you. You know, pick a pick a scenario where you might need to use this, and let's say you got some massing that you need to bring in there real fast, and you've done some you know honeybee ladybug analysis. Uh, what I'm doing right now, though, is I'm just inserting um, a custom stair that I've designed for this uh, example model. Uh, this stair, uh, you would have a hard time building it in Revit. Um, so a couple of things that I'm also doing here to keep in mind is I'm, I'm ungrouping it and I'm exploding the block. Uh, Revit does not like it when you bring the geometry in as a block. They're working on this. Uh, in, in tandem with how to do nested families. So here what we're doing, um, just basically placing the stair uh, on the building.
and putting it into position where I want it. Um, something very important that I want to address here. One is that system families are great for this process of translation. So for example, walls, stairs, curtain walls, um, the larger types, whereas um, the other types of families, you don't really want to use this process because it does bake them in as sort of like a group model. So you, you are limited in the amount of um, options that you have once you get on the Revit side. So, so just a quick little script, um, I'm naming it. This is more like a, an ID for Revit to acknowledge it. Then I'm filtering the category, so I'm going to pick the stair category here. Uh, and then I am putting a Bezier rep, uh, B rep, which is essentially geometry into the Revit model. I need to select the geometry from Rhino first in order for it to go into Revit. And then here I am also filtering out all the materials that Revit has built into this project. Uh, something to note here, if you want to change the materials, so let's say my treads are a different material than my, you know, my handrail, uh, I'm going to need to bake those individually. So that's why this process is a bit flawed and you might want to think about it. So maybe early conceptual schematic stages, this could work out for you, but down the line, you're going to have to create a proper family, which we'll get into. Another thing that I want to mention here is that you have to make sure to check your geometry in, on the Rhino side. You know, make sure it's closed, make sure you have no bad surfaces, no naked edges, uh, and also make sure that, you know, look at this. Yeah, so I built that curve. Um, it looks quite clean in Rhino, but uh, in Revit, I might have to go back to Rhino and rebuild it in order to not make it look like a mesh. So, you know, there are some, you know, push and pulls that you have to consider, but for the most part, depending on how much you have used the Revit kernel, uh, you can get some serious curvy, you know, doubly curved surfaces uh, inside of the Revit environment. Uh, and then notice here, I do have most of the, you know, identity properties that you would have with a native Revit um, piece of geometry built in there. And then also here, uh, you know, it's going to look as if it was built as it looked in Rhino. So this is where this is where the caveat comes in. If you want to give the visibility graphics, you know, turn things off, make it look more decent and like a drawn thing for a document set, you might have to bring this in as a family. And so I leave it to you guys. Obviously, this process is faster, but there is another way to do this. Um, so the other way to do this is to bring it in as a family. So just want to note here that all of these furniture models are not native uh, Revit models. These were built in multiple different software, some in Rhino, some in SketchUp, some as PWGs that I found. This is by far one of my favorite lounge chairs, the PK24. And notice as I'm selecting this, I have all the different materials available to me. I can add subcategories. I can put visibility graphics. It's treating it as a family. And I brought all this information in using Rhino inside with uh, another script that I've written for family uh, distribution. Now, another, another note here, it's treating all the elements of this lounge as their own elements. So it allows you to pick each one and change. Um, here's another example. I, I believe this was um, a SketchUp model. So this is a Finuel a chieftain chair that I was able to bring in um, in a couple of seconds and change the materiality. And then finally, uh, you know, there are different uh, vendors that have their information in CAD but haven't gotten there to develop it in Revit. So this is a, uh, you know, a wash basin that I brought in. I think this is Durbit or they're pretty good with their Revit models, but there was an example where I found one. And so 
Uh, something to note here, right? I brought this in using the, the bake method, as I like to call it, which was the first mes method I showed with the stair. So everything is together. It's treating it as a block. If you wanted to bring in each separate element individually, you would have to bake, you know, the faucets, uh, the sink, and then the legs as their own thing. And that's how you would change the materiality if you didn't want to use the family uh, method, which I am going to show next. I just want to give you guys a sort of a range of what's possible. Um, I'm getting into the granular, but we'll get into the sort of aerial down the line. Um, but first, let's talk about the complexities of this uh, lounge chair and what it takes to bring it in. So we're going to bring it into Revit, and I just want to note that if you model things well, you know, as they say, garbage in, garbage out, right? Then you will essentially get a clean geometry. The Revit kernel will accept it. You won't have such a hard time. In this case, uh, this was not modeled um, so well, at least for the bottom portion of the legs and that back portion of the headrest. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm just investigating what could be wrong. First, I'm going to join it make it into a solid uh, surface. And then I might just do a test to see if it'll go in there. Uh, obviously, there, there's still some, some guess and check here to make sure that the, the rhino geometry is built correctly. Closed surfaces, no bad surfaces, no naked edges, and you should be able to bring in pretty much anything you want. Uh, so this is a family creation script. Now I'm actually getting into using family templates uh, inside of, of Revit to bring in, you know, furniture information, lighting information, and so on. So what I'm doing here is, first off, I'm extracting a, a family template from my Revit uh, library, right? So using a metric one. And you really want to make sure to check your Revit version. This is a manual process. And if you don't type it in correctly, you make, you know, a spelling error. It is not going to work. Uh, this is an override parameter, which will come in later. And then this is override the, the family parameters. So that means visibility graphics and material properties. Here I am naming the family. Um, and then I have to select a model category of how I want it to come in. So if you're using a fur furniture template, you want to use a category of furniture. You could play with them and break it. And this is what I mean by the Pandora's box of like, you know, there are bad things that you can do. Obviously, follow the rules. If it's furniture, make a furniture, not a lighting fixture, and so on. And then make sure it's an ex exploded as a block and then bring it in as a set of B reps, and you have essentially now created a new family inside of Revit. Grasshopper over here is showing us where it would be located based on origin points. And there it is. So now I'm going to go in and investigate a little bit more. And as you can see, most of the, the geometry came in, but some of the pieces did not. Uh, my two thoughts on this are, build the geometry correctly so that it comes in and you can actually, you know, leverage all the different options that Revit has for materiality and so on. Or if you're in a rush or you don't know how to solve the problem, you can use the bake method inside of the family. So before I use the bake method uh, inside of a project, now I'm using the same bake method inside of the family. And so here, notice how, um, well, first I'm going to have to name this for the ID. And then uh, notice how it notices where we're in a furniture family, right? The Carroll Home PK24 Lounge. It's not inside the project. Uh, this, is, this is crucial. So essentially, you can bake information into a project or into a family, which is really cool. Uh, and then I'm just going to set multiple B reps and it's still broken, right? Why is it broken? Well, let's do another check. Uh, 
I'm going to extract the bad surfaces, make sure that I've got all my, you know, my edges clean. And now let's try it again. So there, there is some knowledge base on the, on the Rhino side. It's not going to be, you know, quick if you don't know how to clean and make clean geometry. But that should be the target. So I'll try it one third time. And let's bake it in. And as you can see, yeah. now something crazy here is, as I've noticed over my three different times trying to implement this, you are limited here, right? The materiality, which is what I'm doing, is I'm assigning a material to the thing that I brought in. And notice how it comes in grouped. So that's your limitation if you're going to use the bake method. Now I'm just going to show here that once you once you bake it in with that material it is sort of tied to that material so you want to make sure that you um you name the material that you want it to be on and then you can continue changing it so in this case i use phase existing and then i'm just going to make sure that my material is working uh and let's see um so it's starting to green put the realistic on and there we are right but as i said you are stuck with that material now so name it appropriately and it shouldn't be a problem uh, as i said use this methodology if as your last resort always try to make clean geometry so that you can leverage all the different identity data and parameter options that come with the true native Revit family. So now I'm going to push it. I'm going to do something like a 4,000, you know, and 71 polysurface selection. This crazy chandelier is, I wanted to see if I could break the Revit API with a lot of geometry. And uh, strangely enough, it was able to accept it. And I think partly because it was modeled correctly. So as we can see here, if I zoom in there, I've got a lot of these little diamonds um, that, you know, is something you would normally build with uh, the Grasshopper uh, jewelry tools that uh, Rhino and Grasshopper offer. So what I'm doing here is I'm exploding all the blocks because uh, you don't want any nested information. Uh, and I am going to now bake this in. Notice uh, I'm giving it a name. And then I'm also going to make sure it's a lighting fixture and make sure that the template I'm using is the correct template. Then I'm going to select everything. And uh, strangely enough, I was very impressed uh, to see that it loaded in in about a good couple of seconds. You know, it wasn't depending on how much RAM you have and if you have a desktop, but you arrive at something quite crazy that would take you a very long time to build in Revit. And each one of these has, uh, you know, all the different parameters baked into this. So this is another way to leverage it. We all have custom lighting fixtures that we need to put in in our buildings that um, usually get represented symbolically, and this would give you a nice representation for rendering and also for documentation, because what you could do is you could bake some of this information into one family and then nest some of it into another, for example, the rings. So yeah, this is, this is going to the sort of extremes of um, the the amount of geometry that the kernel could take. As I said, if you have clean geometry, you'll be able to do pretty much anything. Um, for my last example, I will, you know, tackle paneling tools and also roof panelization. Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm literally just building a dome in, in you know, and uh, I use the network surface because it's the cleanest way uh, for it to, to bake in. And this one, I'll probably do a follow-up webinar because I'm kind of glancing over it and doing it really fast, but it does take some time to get uh, accommodated with panelization. And so I'm going to map this dome as adaptive families uh, in the Revit environment using Grasshopper. 
So the first thing I need to do, and this is, you know, big shout out to the McNeil team once again, Raja, Scott, Pascal, and Mr. McNeil himself. Um, I am going to put an adaptive family in here, a uh, four point curtain panel. So I've loaded that into my project. Now I'm gonna go back and open up Rhino. And I am going to map a grid onto that surface. So as we have UVs uh, inside of Rhino, you can also use paneling tools to you know, extrapolate a grid and you can change how that grid operates. So maybe I want, I don't know, 20 subdivisions running on the verticals and uh, make it even. And here we are, right? So I've mapped this, right? We're looking at the ghost of the shell, not to be uh, ironic or pun intended, but uh, now I want to be able, so what's happening is um, Revit is recognizing those points and that's the most important thing that I need from the Rhino side. I need to be able to map those points and now I can apply adaptive uh, panels to those four points. Obviously it works best with four points. If you have three points, which I will probably talk about in the next webinar where I talk about paneling tools and Rhino inside, um, it's not going to work as well. So what I'm doing here, obviously picking the category, it's filtering my types. Uh, the points are being plugged into a custom adaptive family node that is piping that information back in. And then finally, what I want to do here is select the adaptive panel that I just loaded. So Grasshopper is recognizing from Revit that I've got these panels. And so here we are now, those are, you know, live existing inside of the Revit model. And you can manipulate them. So if I wanted to make, you know, this have casing, void in it, make it an actual window, uh, I could go and do it here inside of the Revit environment and not have to bother with, with the Rhino end. Um, another thing that you can do because the information is latent, uh, you can basically plug in uh, a different number and change it and the adaptive panel will change. Um, this is important here at the bottom. Some of them flip the other way, so I might have to go inside the Revit model and flip it back. But it's a very quick and notice um, normally if you were to do this kind of script in Dynamo, it would be very long and this is just quick uh, and, and dirty and like very fast. So just to get you something in there to work with. I know I kind of breeze through all of this, um, but it doesn't take that much time. And I think that's where the power of, of utilizing this, um, this platform lives. So what are the value adds? Um, I personally think that one, you get another tool on the tool belt where you add the grasshopper visual scripting UI and you're able to leverage it inside of the BIM environment. Um, w curved surfaces, airports, um, crazy towers that twist, things that need to be panelized that normally um, the Rhino side handles much better uh, then the Revit side, massings, uh, sustainability, all the like ladybug tools that we're trying to utilize on the Revit side uh, can just be used straight through Grasshopper where they were first invented. You've got, you know, the first visual scripting language, why not use it? At least not visual scripting on the sense of uh, doing a geometric model. I think this one, the evolutionary engines that are coming out, and being able to leverage those uh, inside of uh, the, the Revit environment is gonna be a, a game changer. Library translation. I know there's multiple firms, companies, vendors that have libraries in old formats, DWGs, uh, not, or SATs, FBX, right? And you can, you can translate those things. It's also something that we always run across with the, the sort of accessories, the furniture, all the things that, you know, with that FFNE space that 
are never, you're never able to find something that represents it correctly. Um, the other thing that I kind of didn't touch on, but probably will touch on in, in the next webinar where I might do a follow-up to this, is document sets are continued. So when you bring in this information, uh, you can cut it in Revit, which is a really big thing because before, when we were bringing in DWGs or so on, <coughs> Revit would have a really hard time representing it or notating it graphically so that it was readable. Um, yes, so that is the end of my presentation. Uh, I tried to keep it within uh, 45 minutes so I could give you guys room for questions. I know I sped through that so we can go back and sort of review some of the video slides. As I said, this is going to be posted on uh, our YouTube channel and also um, on the Microdesk website. And uh, yeah, once again, big shout out to the Co-Innovation Lab and big shout out to McNeil and the Autodesk team for making this happen. Uh, does anyone have questions? All right, I'm going to start from the top and go, yes, there will be a record of this webinar, as I said. Can you place the family you just imported from Rhino in multiple points with the same script, or will Rhino create copies of the same family? Interesting question. Um, depending on the, the import method, um, if you're importing it with the bake, it's going to treat it almost as like a model in place, right? Whereas uh, if you imported it as um, an actual family, you're going to have to array it yourself. But I like where this question is going, Carmine, because you're essentially provoking something that is a problem in Revit where you can't do, uh, you know, arrays on a curve or arrays in, in different directions. And so that's, that's a beautiful question that I would love to investigate myself. Um, as for now, the way that I would do it is I would just array it inside of of the Rhino environment and then bring it back in, you know, with those points. But it's not going to be as native as if you were importing it uh, as a new family. Um, next question is also from Carmine. Um, is a mass import is a mass imported from Rhino? Can it be edited, host geometry, and Revit? I remember in early versions of Rhino inside it was a bit tricky to make it work. Yeah, this is a great question. So because the mass, um, and I've tried this too, so the question that Carmine is asking is, can I essentially change the walls to be Revit walls? Uh, and no, you can't, and they're working on this because the massing portion of the way Revit is built doesn't allow for you to, um, to I guess, hack the API, which is what uh, Rhino Inside is doing. So what you would need to do is use it as a reference and rebuild it for now. This is a big one because what this means is that you would essentially have to, to script each category on its own rather than as a massing. Uh, good question, Tyler Putnam. What does training or consulting look like? Um, I think this is a great example of what Microdesk can offer in terms of training and uh, also in terms of um, what our consulting services can produce. I, I think we're a great sort of uh, coagulator of the different um, ACO platforms. Um, if you guys want more training on this, we are happy to custom, you know, make uh, different curriculums for whatever your office is looking to achieve. And like I said, there's many different areas where training can happen on and also implementation of the software can happen. So like one example is custom furniture for rendered environments and walkthroughs. Uh, another example is uh, library translation. Get your whole office's library moved into the proper BIM environment and your families.
Does anyone else have a question? Well, if that's good question, Jacob. Um, sources for tutorials, uh, as you know, it's a, it's a tinkerer's kind of market that we are in with uh, this platform. But inside of the, the help icon here, you have tutorials of how to enter. And then also inside of the Rhino inside a downloader, there are some tutorials and some free scripts, which you just type in Rhino inside Revit. Uh, it'll give you a, a sort of good start of where to go, guys, right? This is still being built, so I highly recommend you go on Food for Rhino and get on the community platforms where if you have a question, I've never seen someone not respond on, um, on Food for Rhino. And this is how I've been able to solve some of my you know, family problems and diagnose, dissect, get feedback. Obviously, the McNeil team is constantly looking for feedback. Uh, What's great now is that you actually have an MSI installer. When this first came out, you had to sort of figure out how to install it yourself. Um, and of course, uh, Microdesk is uh, quite the resource on this end as well, because we've been pushing this in multiple firms. So now we have a good kind of track record of implementing it in the right capacity. Does anyone else have any more questions? Are you also working with infrastructure projects um, from Jacob? Uh, yeah, of course. I mean, you can bring in, I, I think if the question you're asking is uh, the geometry that you can bring in, absolutely. Like I would use this on the landscape end, on the topography end. Um, where bringing in massings cleanly for context, this would be a game changer as well. Um, and if you're changing your massing, you can you know identify it in real world locations and bring it in that way too. So you got proper GIS. If you mean if is Microdesk working on infrastructure projects, yes, we are. <laughs> That's the other way I can read your question. Um, we've got 10 more minutes for another interesting question. You have one. Awesome. Well, I'm going to, to wrap this up. This will be posted um, possibly tomorrow on our website. And uh, yeah, I look forward to presenting another one on how to do curtain panels and panelization on a more advanced level. Um, thanks everyone so much for attending. Uh, this was a lot of fun and I'm really happy to be sharing this and getting this out into the world because um, I think it's gonna change the way we think about the way we translate geometry. All right. Well, have a good day, everybody.